Thank you very much. They uh, needed someone to speak that the Americans could understand, so <laughs> pretty much me. It's nice to be uh, in a room with sane people. I work in a university, so it's uh, <laughs> a little bit unusual. I don't know if Nigel's here, but I just want to say he is the man who brought us Brexit, which was a great thing. I uh, just think he did. I was, uh, I was chatting to him last night, and with that kind of, you know, influence on the world, I said, what do you, you know, Nigel, what, what, what about your legacy? What do you want people to be saying about you in 100 years? And Nigel looked at me, and he said, Jim, in 100 years, I think I'd like people to be saying something along the lines of, isn't it remarkable that he's still sexually active? <laughs> so, <clears throat> he didn't say that, but I think he was thinking it. Uh, <laughs> So, and, you know, just speaking of Brexit, there's a thing called the Times Higher Education Supplement. And back just before the Brexit referendum, nine out of 10 academics, over 90%, said they were going to vote Remain. So nine out of 10 wanted this super, super nationalist, non-democratic body. And remember, the actual vote was 52% leave. So, and of that, 40% of said these academics, if, if, a, if there were a leave vote, they were going to leave. They were going to leave the country. Now, that never happens. It's like Hollywood after Trump. It never happens. It's just a typical posturing, bumper sticker moralizing, virtue signaling. Um, and I got to tell you, this is my favorite story about to Brexit before I move on to Australia. But uh, after the Brexit vote, there was a Cambridge University academic, her name was Victoria Bateman, and she was so distraught by the vote, by the ill-informed, know-nothing, native, sort of nativist, racist, misogynist, small Englanders. That's why I would have voted for Brexit, but I think other people had a different view. <laughs> but uh, she was so distraught that she went to her first Cambridge University economics department uh, meeting after the vote, and she went naked, no clothes, She'd written on her breast and stomach, Brexit leaves Britain naked. Now, I don't profess to speak for everyone, but I think we need more protesters like Victoria Bateman. <laughs> and, and, and that's not just because, based on the photos, uh, she was extremely pulchritudinous. You can look that one up. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I always think if you're going to be condescending and dismissive and against democracy, then the very least you can do is show up to faculty meetings naked. Yeah. Uh, and, and if anybody out here is looking for an academic economist, let me recommend Victoria ba Bateman. She's not, she's, not just, she's not just ambitious, she's nakedly ambitious. <laughs> so, okay, so I've got to paint you a picture of where I work. I work at one of the oldest... Uh, universities in Australia, G8, elite, you know, we don't even take half a percent of the students who apply to us. And so this is the sort of, according to the Australian Green Party, uh, this is the home of the fair dinkum Australia battler. So that would be Adam, Adam Bant's view of what uh, the median voter looks like would be a G8 university campus. So some days, about mid-morning, you know, I'll venture out with colleagues for a coffee at the local Merlot's right on campus. It's the busiest Merlot's in, Bri in Brisbane. And, uh, you know, I can tell you, academics think they work hard. Well, I spent a few years working at a big law firm in Toronto and then at the bar in London. I can assure you that academics do not work hard. Um, heck, I don't work hard. So, uh, but, you know, we wander down to Merlot's and some of the patrons there will be ordering their half macchiato on soya milk. And, you know, others will be having decaf flat whites on almond milk. And then you'll notice people who are asking for cappuccinos on oat milk because someone has told them that almonds use up too much water. So they've moved on to oat. Um, taking regular milk the way I do, very judgmental stares at you. It's a, every second person has a nut allergy who knew. Uh, <laughs> Gluten-free brownies are the order of the day, and prefer if, you know, it's better if they're baked in some anti-capitalist collective commune run by lesbians. But uh, <laughs> until very recently, lots and lots of customers, and I'm not making this up, lots and lots of customers would pull into the university car park fully masked, and they're in the car by themselves. <laughs> uh, I do not know what part of the science TM uh, dictates that sort of behavior. Um, so you can see how shocking it is. It, this is, uh, this is they, were, they were so petrified during the uh, lockdown. Uh, so many people wearing masks. I went in every day because we didn't have much of a lockdown in uh, 
Queensland, you people in Victoria, I don't know how you did it. I think I would have been at the, ram the ramparts. But um, at any rate, let me just quickly, I've got enough time to quickly compare the ABC with uh, a, a university campus. So remember the ABC. So we give them, what, $1.4 billion a year. Um, when you look at their main television current affairs programs, there's not a single producer, presenter, anyone who can, you, you can identify as a right of center, center person. Uh, when James Dellingpole came out here, remember he said uh, the ABC makes the BBC look like Fox News. I think that's about right. <laughs> and and uh, I think that's right, actually. And it's, it's, it's worse even than the CBC. I'm, I'm Canadian. But uh, the former managing director, Mark Scott, and it goes without saying that he's now a university vice chancellor because, you know, that's the same sort of crowd. Well, Scott, when people would point this out, he would often say, uh, you know, you don't need that because uh, my top level, top class journalists, they all look inside themselves and they do their best to be impartial and disinterested. Can you imagine, can you imagine that sort of response if everyone were a conservative uh, journalist? You know, or even imagine this, imagine that uh, all of the ABC top people were men and, you know, some women quite rightfully objected to this. And can you imagine the managing director of the ABC saying, well, look, all the men, they look inside themselves and they do the best job they can to present a women's point of view. There's just absolutely no chance that would work. All right, so here's some figures about universities. They're pretty bad. In the US, we know this because donations are public information. So uh, because of that and because they do a lot of surveys, uh, at top level US law schools, it's about eight or nine to one uh, donating to the Democrats to, than to the Republicans. And outside of the Ivy League, it's worse, worse in the sense of more imbalanced. If you're a university administrator, then it's better because you're trying to get rid of them all. But um, so that's shocking. And the reason why it's better in Ivy Leagues is if you're going to hang in there and, and sort of you know, be a tiny minority, you'll, you'll do it at Yale and Harvard, you probably won't do it at Vermont. So, uh, the, and, and that's law schools. There are whole departments, whole university departments where you cannot find a conservative. You know, we can all, we all know what they are, women's studies departments, uh, Aboriginal studies departments, sociology, politics isn't very good anymore, um, economics, although we do have Ms. Bateman, so I don't want to be too critical of economics, but, uh, um, Jonathan Haidt, who's a center-left guy, but very unhappy about the collapse of viewpoint diversity. Uh, because one of the reasons I think we have this collapse in viewpoint diversity is in the name of diversity and what universities and now corporations, big law firms, what they do is they find some desirable job and then they take some group, it's arbitrary, and they look at the percentage of the group in on the corporate board or in the you know attractive desirable job and they look for statistical equivalencies, right? They never pick bad jobs. They never say 95% of jobs that uh, where people die on the job are held by men, that's true. And you know, only 5% of women are dying on the job. So we gotta, we gotta get 90% more women out there dying on the job. We need statistical, they never do that. Um, and the problem with the diversity thing is that conservatives like me, look, I don't want that. I, I wanna go with merit. I wouldn't even go for quotas on uh, viewpoint diversity. But it is killing, it is killing the number of uh, conservatives on campus. There are very, very few of us. Um, so I, if you took someone like me, I could never be dean because to be totally honest, I'm not doing an acknowledgement of country. I think it's patronizing, demeaning, and condescending. And I have, yet, I have yet to see the university vice chancellor who, who actually op gives her, her or his house to uh, an Aboriginal person. Because if you really believe it's stolen land, then the, you know, the implication is you should get out of your house. But that never happens. I never see that. So uh, you could probably become a dean without any problem at all if you refuse to stand for the national anthem. No problem. So it's a very one-sided thing. Let me finish with a quick joke, because I think we need to take the piss out of Green Party voters. So I'm going to finish with the story of the, uh, the uh, Warren Mundine walking down the beach, and he stumbles on this little ancient-looking bottle. He rubs it. The genie comes out. The genie says, you know what? 
I'm a special genie, you get three wishes. So Warren goes, really? Why are you special? And the genie says, well, everything you get, every Green Party voter in Australia will get two of them. So Warren says, okay, well, I'll have a million dollars. She blinks her eyes. She says, now remember, every single Green Party voter in Australia now has $2 million. Because they get twice what Warren gets. What's your second wish? She goes, oh, I'll have a German sports car. So she blinks her eyes. She says, now remember, every Green Party voter in Australia now gets double that, so they now have two sports cars. What's your third and final wish? And Warren's a smart guy. He thinks about it for a second, and he goes, eh, you know, I always wanted to donate a kidney. <laughs>